All right, uh, next up we have Michael Osman giving a talk called Cautionary Tra Tales from the History of Secrecy. Michael Osman is an engineer and founder of Great Scott Gadgets. They make RF spectrum more hackable with tools like Ubertooth One, the Yardstick One, and the HackRF. All Great Scott Gadgets designs are open source hardware and made with KiCad. Please welcome him to the stage. Thank you. All right, gather around everyone, it's story time. I'm here today to tell stories from humanity's dangerous proprietary past. You see, we didn't always live in an open source utopia. No. There was once a company called Boeing, long ago, in the 20th and 21st centuries. Now, Boeing was one of the world's largest manufacturers of aircraft. And one of Boeing's airplanes uh, was particularly famous. The 737 was the best-selling commercial jet aircraft in the history of aviation. And every decade or so, Boeing released an update to the 737 design. And, and each update was better and safer than the one that came before until the year 2018, when Boeing released the 737 MAX. And now, the Boeing 737 MAX was different than 737s that came before in several ways. Most notably, the engines were updated. The engines were, were new, they were quieter, but they were also larger and much more powerful. And they were so much larger that they couldn't be mounted under the wing like they were in previous 737s. Otherwise, they would have dragged on the ground. So they were moved forward of the wing. And this had the unfortunate side effect of resulting in, a, in an overpitch problem. In certain conditions, the nose of the aircraft could pitch up dangerously uh, so much so that it could result in a stall, which would have been a terrible thing. And so a safety measure was put in place. And because it isn't a hardware bug if you can fix it in software, right? <laughs> There's no such thing as a hardware bug, as long as it can be fixed in software. The, and that's exactly, uh, the, that's exactly what Boeing did by implementing something called MCAS, a new system, the Maneuvering Characteristics Augmentation System, which is a pretty fancy name for a fairly simple function. All it did was detect over pitch situations and then force the nose of the aircraft down uh, by automatically swiveling the horizontal tail. Now, this is a very notable change from the way 737 aircrafts operated, uh, the previous models of 737 operated in the past. Remember that this was early in the days of computer-controlled vehicles. And human pilots were still present on airplanes and were required on airplanes and were trusted more than computer control systems. And Boeing in particular, had a reputation among pilots for having the computer systems be subordinate to the human pilot, not the other way around. But the MCAS was something that would override the human pilot's control. And that was, a, that was something that was very unexpected from the perspective of pilots of the day. It was particularly unexpected because Boeing rolled out the 737 MAX with minimal training for pilots. Just a little update on here's what's new in this airplane. And they neglected to mention the existence of the MCAS to pilots at that time. Now, the MCAS was implicated in two famous crashes in the early days, in the first few months of the 737 being in service. And in both cases, the MCAS responded to 
an erroneous reading from the angle of attack sensor near the nose of the aircraft. It thought that the plane was pitched up too high. In fact, it wasn't. And so the MCAS literally forced the plane into the ground. And in both crashes, it was determined that this is what happened. Now, one, there, was a lot, there were a lot of things that can be said about these incidents. There were a lot of things that can be said about why Boeing was motivated to call this aircraft a 737 and why they were motivated to release it with minimal pilot training required and, and why the sensor failed in the first place or, or why, on the other hand, they didn't just completely have the aircraft controlled by, by computers and do away with human pilots. But the, the one thing that stands out to me that's very interesting about this event is that this happened back in the era when people believed in something called intellectual property. And this system was actually kept secret from the operators of the aircraft, and it was actually considered ethical for them to have the, not only the hardware design, but also the software of this system kept pr proprietary. The software, in fact, had a couple of different versions. And one thing you might notice about this angle of attack sensor is that it's on the side of the nose of the aircraft. Well, guess what? There's a second sensor on the other side. And in both cases, in both of these famous crashes, the software was responding only to one sensor. It didn't consider input from the second sensor. Now, the reason that the, soft, that the version of the software being used in these crashes was, was only looking at one sensor, not both, was that the airlines in question had not paid Boeing the extra fee that Boeing charged for the version of the software that would look at both sensor readings, consider both, and alert the pilots when there was a discrepancy between the two sensors. This was something that was held as a proprietary extra feature, not as something that was disclosed and made available to all operators of the aircraft as an essential safety feature. 346 people died. And this is from a company in the United States airline industry, an industry that probably should have known by the early 21st century that uh, of the dangers of proprietary technology. This is an industry that was held back famously in its first decade by the patent trolls known as the Wright brothers. Now, the Wright brothers did so much damage to the United States aviation industry in its early days that when the U.S. entered the First World War, it did so with French aircraft. Why French aircraft? Because no one in the United States was able to manufacture aircraft that could compete with European planes. Now, this situation was corrected during the war because uh, it, the U.S. government intervened and forced reasonable license, licensing terms onto the Wright brothers. Now, if you think 346 is a large death toll from a secret technology, I invite you to consider the birthing forceps an invention kept secret for more than a century. In the first decade or two of the 17th century, birthing forceps were invented either by Peter Chamberlain or by his brother, Peter Chamberlain. Go figure. Uh, both of them were specialists who assisted mothers with uh, obstructed, difficult births. 
And one of them, both of them used these birthing forceps and then passed down the invention through generations of the Chamberlain family. The, uh, this invention was an incredibly important life-saving technology. It was, it's difficult to uh, overstate how important it was, in fact. If you consider that this was before we had a germ theory of disease, long before we had antiseptic practices or anything like antibiotics, we didn't even understand that disease came from germs. So, for example, a cesarean section was a death sentence for a mother. Now, the Chamberlains went to great lengths to keep this invention secret. They would arrive when called upon to assist with a birth in a fancy carriage and bring this enormous gilded box out of the carriage and into the delivery room. They kicked everybody out of the delivery room, blindfolded the mother, opened the box in secret, and proceeded to make all sorts of strange sounds emanate from the room, like ringing of bells. And they gave the impression that their secret device was much more elaborate than it in fact was. But it was a very successful device that assisted a number of those fortunate mothers who were members of the English royal family or other ultra-rich nobility in those days. Because the tools that came before this one looked more like medieval torture instruments. Because before anyone figured out that such a simple tool could be used to help extract the head of an infant from a mother safely, infants were extracted piecemeal if necessary. And I apologize if any of you are squirming in your seats, especially if any of you are pregnant. I promise it gets better. It gets much better. It is difficult to assess just how much of an impact birthing forceps had on the world and how much of an impact they would have had, how many lives would have been saved if this technology had not been passed down as a secret through the Chamberlain family for more than 100 years. But I've tried to investigate this a little bit. And here are some maternal mortality statistics. How many mothers died while pregnant or, or from childbirth? Going back to the year 1800, this, this covers a 200-year period of history from 1800 to the year 2000. Unfortunately, I couldn't find any good statistics. Uh, no country was tracking uh, maternal mortality statistics uh, very much further back than this. But there are some interesting things in this plot. First of all, I, told you, I promised you it would get better. It really does get better. As you can see, by the late 20th century, maternal mortality was very much a solved problem. Now, becoming pregnant is and may always be a little bit of a dangerous proposition, but the horrors of the past are over. And you can see that things changed dramatically around the year 1945, which was when we had mass production of penicillin. And about a decade before that, things were already getting better because of antibacterial sulfa drugs. Things got a little worse in the early 20th century, and that's generally chalked up to unsafe abortions. But in the late 19th century, we were seeing a downward trend in maternal mortality already because we had the germ theory of disease and were starting to adopt antiseptic practices, which saved many lives. Now, the most interesting thing about this plot to me is the difference between the two countries that have data going back to the beginning of the 19th century. Finland in blue and Sweden in orange. Notice how they start out at about the same mortality rate. But Finland doesn't improve 
until antiseptic practices are adopted near the end of the century. Sweden, however, exhibits improvement throughout the 19th century. And what did Sweden do? Well, in the early years of the 19th century, Sweden established a school for midwives. Sweden established standardized education and certification for midwives and had cooperation between midwives and physicians, whereas in other countries, doctors and midwives competed with one, with one another. One of the things taught to all midwives in Sweden was the use of birthing forceps. There was a, a one notable anomaly there. You might notice in the year 1884, Sweden had an incredible spike in maternal mortality. This, by the way, happened to be due to a smallpox epidemic that was made worse by a, a strong anti-vax movement in Stockholm. Now, forceps, birthing forceps became widely available in about the year 1730, which was before this plot. How did maternal mortality look back then? Well, the best paper I've been able to find is this estimate based on a variety of different types of records uh, from the 16th through 18th centuries by Wilmot Dobby. And Dobby concludes that there were somewhere in the neighborhood of 26.8 maternal deaths per thousand baptisms, which is basically equivalent to a thousand births in that time period in, in his sample area. And if you put that on the same plot, it's way up there. That is how often mothers died prior to, more or less, the adoption of birthing forceps. So how many how many mothers died and how many children died, which is an even harder statistic to uncover, during that 100-year period of the secrecy of birthing forceps? I don't know, but I have a pretty good idea that it was a lot more than 346. Now, I'd like to change the subject a little bit, something a little bit lighter, and that is actually a fairly dark shade of blue. It looks a little bit purple up here, but... Uh, that's because this is supposed to be Prussian blue, which is a, a color that is famously difficult to represent on these archaic screens from the 21st century. Now, Prussian blue was an invention that was held as a trade secret for a time. It was first synthesized in Berlin in about the year 1706, and the, the origin of Prussian blue involves three gentlemen named Johann. Johann Dippel was a very interesting character. He was born in Castle Frankenstein, and he actually published speculation about transference of the human soul from one body to another, and he was an alchemist, and he was doing weird things with animal blood and bones in his lab. I am not making this up. He very likely, uh, le legends about him very likely influenced Mary Shelley uh, when she wrote Frankenstein. And Dippel was sharing this alchemy lab in Berlin at the time with Johann Diesbach, who also dabbled in alchemy, but was working for Johann Frisch to produce some pigments to sell to painters around Europe. And Johann Diesbach was trying to prepare some red pigment when he ran out of potash and borrowed some from his lab mate, Dippel. And this potash happened to be tainted with animal blood. Well, it turned out that a, an unforeseen chemical reaction took place and his red pigment turned incredible dark shade of blue. Prussian blue was born, and almost immediately it began to be marketed by Johann Frisch and held as a trade secret by these three Johans. Prussian blue was incredibly important because this is what European art looked like before Prussian blue. You might notice there wasn't much blue. If you wanted to make something blue before Prussian blue, 
you had two choices. You could use a pigment, mostly plant-derived, that was not light fast, meaning it would fade away over time and exposure to light. Or you could use ultramarine, which was a pigment created by grinding up gemstones. It was very, very expensive. And so blue was used sparingly in the, the days before Prussian blue, and typically only in artwork sponsored by the church. After Prussian blue, European artwork exploded with blue. And the, the secret of the production of Prussian blue was, in fact, not a very well-kept secret. It was for a short time, but for a variety of reasons, the secret got out. Uh, perhaps this had something to do with the fact that Johann Dippel was uh, run out of town and had to flee the country to Netherlands and then went into competition with the other Johans. Perhaps this had something to do with the formula for Prussian blue being reverse engineered, but the person who claimed to reverse engineer it was insistent on anonymity and happened to come from Berlin. So maybe it wasn't so much reverse engineering. But for one reason or another, the formula for, for Prussian blue, or the recipe, leaked in detail in less than 20 years from its invention. And so despite having uh, attempted to hold it as a trade secret, uh, its creators were no longer the exclusive source of Prussian blue, and it exploded in popularity throughout Europe. It made its way outside of Europe before long as well. Now one really good example, by the way, of Prussian blue is the old guitarist, uh, the middle of the right side of the screen here, the uh, very famous painting from Picasso's Blue Period, which happens to be on display right now at the Museum of the Art Institute of Chicago which I highly recommend you check out. And another piece on display right now for a limited time at the Art Museum, at the Museum of the Art Institute of Chicago is the Great Wave off Kanagawa. This particular print of the Great Wave, uh, you might notice you can see some pink sky at the top, which is something that has faded away from most copies of this print, but this one is one that they have at the Art Institute, and they display it from time to time, and right now is one of those times. And this is another work of art that famously uses a very prominent blue, that is Prussian blue. It took about a hundred years before Prussian blue production made its way to Asia, but once it did, there was an explosion of blue there as well, and it became so popular among these Japanese woodblock artists, uh, and they use such bold use of Prussian blue that when those works of art were shown at an exhibition in Europe, the Europeans thought it was an entirely new blue pigment that came from Japan. They didn't even know that the Japanese blue at first, they didn't realize the Japanese blue was, in fact, Prussian blue that had originated in Europe, made its way to Japan, and come back to Europe. Now, there were many other blues synthesized and many other colors other than blue synthesized over the years after Prussian blue was invented. But Prussian blue was the first, and it was heralded as the first synthetic, synthetic pigment. However, that was incorrect. It was the era's first synthetic pigment, but the actual first synthetic pigment was Egyptian blue. It was a blue pigment forged in the kilns of ancient Egypt, but it was a technology that was later lost. And this pigment, this lighter blue, can still be seen on Egyptian, ancient Egyptian paintings and objects it has retained its color for thousands of years. Now, how was this important pigment lost? We don't know. But if I may speculate, imagine that the secret of Egyptian blue 
pigment production was a trade secret maintained by a family or a guild. And imagine that maybe an invading army killed off that family. Or famine forced the family to move away from a place where they had the raw materials to produce this stuff. Or for whatever reason, it just became economically advantageous to start doing something other than producing this pigment. If they didn't write down their recipe and share it, it was always at risk of being lost. And that's very likely how we lost a number of important ancient technologies like Roman concrete and Greek fire and Damascus steel and things that were not uh, figured out again for hundreds or thousands of years. Now one technology that was not lost from ancient times was perhaps the best kept trade secret in history. And that was the existence of these little beasts. Silkworms were first domesticated in the Neolithic period in China. This was prehistoric. The, the silkworm produces a cocoon, and the cocoons are harvested and unraveled to produce silk thread, which can then be woven into a very fine fabric. And silk was so valuable, so highly regarded as a fabric, because it was, it was such a, a finer thread, a stronger thread. And silk clothing was comfortable in, in any weather, and it was lightweight. It even protected the wearer from insect bites. It was beautiful. There were so many reasons why silk was highly sought after. And the secret of its production was maintained for an incredibly long period of time. China started trading international, on a large scale, trading silk internationally at least 500 years before the Common Era, and for about a thousand years after that, the secret of how silk was produced never made it to Europe. During those years, the, the trade routes between China and the West were collectively known as the Silk Road, because silk was the most important commodity traded. It was incredibly valuable. It was so high priced that it was only ever in those years a luxury item that the ultra rich could afford. Uh, until the very end of the Roman Empire when it became so popular, Rome bought, bought so much silk, they dumped so much money over the Silk Road that it is often cited as one of the reasons for the fall of the Roman Empire. Now, imagine for a moment, imagine for a moment if instead of holding this, the secret of Silk's origin proprietary, instead of Europeans thinking that maybe it came from a plant, what if the ancient Chinese actually shared their knowledge, and silk were produced far and wide around the world. There were so many important technologies that silk enabled. In later years, centuries later, when silk was produced in Europe and elsewhere around the world, the cost of silk finally declined and it found all sorts of other interesting applications because silk was the strongest fiber known by weight for thousands of years. It found applications in things like surgical sutures, in things like hot air balloons, parachutes, bicycle tires. Imagine if Imagine if China had shared this knowledge, and back when the Romans went crazy for silk, they actually implemented their own silk production and drove down the cost of silk. Could we have had hot air balloons 2,000 years previous 
ultimately to their invention on our, in our history? Would the descendants of Chinese royalty have been better off if instead of holding silk production as a trade secret, their ancestors shared that knowledge and allowed the technologies that might have resulted to come back to them? Europeans could have traveled by air to China, bringing the technology of air travel there thousands of years ago, in theory. Today, of course, we live in this open source utopia. But it wasn't always like that. People believed in something called intellectual property. The the popularity of open source software coincided with people sharing things over the internet in the early days of the internet. And the popularity of open source hardware emerged in the 21st century, and it was largely enabled by open source software. Software was making its way into all the things around us in our daily lives, physical objects that did not run software before began to run software, and they did so because they had electronics, and those electronics developers were the pioneers of open source hardware. If it weren't for the open source software tools, oh, by the way, silkworms are also a tasty treat, if it weren't for open source software tools like KiCad, we still would languish in an era of dangerous secrecy. Thank you.